is a joy to be with you. I uh, flew in this morning about uh, 6.40 uh, from the States. I was scheduled in yesterday. My uh, plane had mechanical problems in Dallas, and uh, I won't go into all the details, but I missed my connection flight to uh, Brisbane uh, yesterday. And so I uh, just arrived this morning. So if I'm a little groggy, you know, forgive me, by tomorrow I should be uh, back to normal. But it is a uh, delight to uh, be with you and to be back in Australia. It's been many, many years since I've, uh, I've been here. But uh, a joy to be with you. As I tell people as I travel around, it's always good to meet the rest of the family. And uh, whether you like it or not, I'm your brother. And whether I like it or not, you're uh, brothers and sisters of mine. We may have different mothers, but we all have the same father. So, uh, praise the Lord. We are going to be uh, spending a number of hours together, so let me just say right at the very onset, I would encourage you to be good Bereans. Don't just swallow everything I say just because I have flown in on an international basis doesn't give me any more authority than the local authority. And, uh, you know, many times we think because somebody flies overseas, he's got all the answers. Uh, that's not always true. But um, be a good Berean. Whatever I say needs to be uh, uh, based on the Word of God, and you need to be ones that uh, will, again, examine the Scriptures to see if what I say is so. If you look at the context of that in Acts 17, uh, I always get a chuckle out of it. They were um, examining the Scriptures after being taught by the Apostle Paul. You'd think, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul's word would be final enough that you don't have to go back to the Scripture to uh, make sure that what Paul is saying is right. So if they did it for Paul, how much more for David Ravenhill? So I would encourage you anyway just to uh, get into the, uh, the word. Tonight I want to uh, begin by laying a foundation on, um, well, really a foundation of everything that I want to say. I want to speak on the cross it's a uh, message uh, that God gave me many years ago. My wife and I graduated from Bible school in 1964. And um, our first ministry together was with uh, David Wilkerson in the early days of the Teen Challenge uh, Center in New York City. One Sunday afternoon, I was sitting asking myself a question. The question was, why is the world still, uh, still unevangelized? We've had 2,000 years that have gone by since uh, Calvary, 2,000 years since the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And uh, why is it that the church is still trying to fulfill the Great uh, Commission? What is wrong? And out of that question, God began to uh, unfold to me that we uh, have a, a basic problem with the presentation of the gospel. And uh, what I'm going to do tonight is uh, give you... Uh, an understanding of why Jesus Christ died. As you know, those of you who are pastors, and there's a number of you here, there's uh, numerous words used to describe the, uh, what God has done in the, uh, the overall word of salvation. Salvation is an all-inclusive word, as you know, that begins with the moment we're saved all the way through to our ultimate glorification when we uh, enter those pearly gates. But uh, there's a number of words. Uh, one of those words is uh, propitiation, which is a spiritual term. It is taken from the temple. There is the word justification that we are all familiar with, which is a judicial term uh, taken from the uh, court. There is the uh, word reconciliation, which is um, a social uh, term uh, taken from uh, society. And then there is the word redemption. Redemption is a commercial term taken from the business world. And it is this word, uh, redemption, that I am basically basing my thoughts around tonight. It takes all of those different terms to give you a full understanding of all that Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And yet I think it is the, the word redemption that we fail to really emphasize the way we should. And so that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about tonight. We have uh, made the cross very much a man-centered uh, gospel, and uh, we need to uh, see it uh, in its proper uh, perspective, and that is that the cross is really uh, for God's sake more than for our sake. And that may come uh, as a strange statement for some of you, but uh, you know we've uh, repackaged the gospel over the years to try and make it presentable. 
Uh, we now have a seeker-sensitive uh, God that uh, would not offend you by talking about sin or anything like that, and so on and so forth, and the gospel is sort of morphing as it goes, uh, goes along. We now have the emergent church that is questioning the, the Word of God. It's really an emergent Bible that has produced an emergent church because they uh, now have taken the authority away from the authority of Scriptures and placed it on the person that interprets those Scriptures as the one that is the final authority. And so we're seeing changes taking place. We need to get back to the Word of God. I make no bones about the fact that I'm an old-fashioned preacher, not just because of my age, but uh, because uh, everything that pertains to life and godliness is in the Word of God. We don't need a new Bible. We don't need a new emphasis on it. Amen. We just need to get back to believing that uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you have your Bible then, I trust you do, open, uh, if you will, to the Epistle of John. I want to begin there, and I want to begin by uh, laying a little bit of a foundation. Epistle of John, chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. John says, I am writing to you little children. Verse 13, he says, I am writing to you fathers. And also in verse 13, I am writing to you young men three categories that John is addressing here. He's not uh, writing to the Sunday school department. He's not writing to the youth department. Uh, and he's not writing to the retiree department. He's uh, writing to three levels of spiritual maturity. How many of you know you can be 99 years of age and be a babe in Christ? Or you can be 20 years of age and be a seasoned man or woman of God? And uh, so we begin the Christian life the way we begin the natural life, we begin as a babe. Nobody in this room came out of the womb weighing, you know, 10 stone and speaking uh, fluent Aussie. Uh, we all started the same way. We came into the world as babies. The wonderful thing about a baby is it has no past. And so John says, I write to you children because your sins are forgiven you. If a baby could express itself and it was uh, screaming at the top of its lungs, here it is, three weeks old, and mother goes in in the middle of the night to wonder, to try and figure out why the baby is screaming, if that baby could articulate the problem, you would never hear that baby say, Mom, the reason I can't sleep is because of all those horrendous things I've done in the past. No, it's a baby. It's only three weeks old. It has no past. If any man be in Christ, he is a new babe, and old things have passed away. And so... He says, I write to your children, your sins have forgiven you. If I were to take one term or one word to describe each of these levels, the first level is the word regeneration or conversion. The Christian life begins when you realize you're a sinner and only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse you from that sin. And uh, once we embrace that, we are free from the past Although these days, uh, you know, the six-fold ministry is counseling and we are now digging up the past and examining the past like never before. But if we really are born again of the Spirit of God, it should be dealt with. The reason there's a need for counseling is because we have not presented a full gospel. And so people have still got their hang-ups and their problems and so on. But anyway, we won't uh, deal with that right now. And then he says, I write to you young men. It isn't too long before... Uh, you begin to grow as a Christian, that you realize you have an adversary. And he says, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. The enemy is there to try and sabotage everything that God is doing in your life, to try and undermine your faith, to bring discouragement, and doubt, and fears, and lure you back into sin, and all of those things. And he elaborates a little bit further in verse 14. He says, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. The Word of God abides in you, and you've overcome the evil one. There we have the key to overcoming the evil one. It is to be strong. Not physical strength, but spiritual strength. We become strong by having the Word of God abiding in us. If I were to put that in what I think is more a logical sequence, it would be, I write to you young, you young man, you have the Word of God abiding in you, because the Word of God abides in you, you're strong, because you're strong, you're able to overcome the evil one. The word that I would use to describe that season would be the word maturation. 
Again, uh, they've now begun to grow, mature, stand on their own two feet, defend themselves from the attack of the enemy, and so on. <clears throat> and then he addresses the fathers. And he says, I write to you, fathers, because you know him that is from the beginning. He repeats the same thing in verse 14. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him that is from the beginning. For many years, I was somewhat disappointed with uh, John's revelation on, uh, on fathers. It seems to be anticlimactic. He begins with, I write to your children, your sins are forgiven you. He goes on to say, I write to your children because you know the father. Then I write to you, young man, you're strong. If the word of God abides in you, you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, fathers, because you know him that is from the beginning. It seems to just sort of taper off. If I'd have been writing about fathers, I would say, I write to you, fathers, because you you know, understand Daniel and Revelation perfectly. Uh, you've been on three 40-day fasts. You've uh, memorized X number of scriptures. You've been on a few missions trips. You know, you've cast out a few devils and raised the dead. You know, some sort of wow factor. So, you know, I write to your children, write to your young men, write to you. Wow, you know. And all he says is, uh, you know him that's been from the beginning. What's the difference then between knowing him that is from the beginning and what he says to the children? I write to your children because you know the father. Seems to be redundant, seems to be saying the same thing. Well, there is a big difference between knowing the Father and knowing Him that is from the beginning. Children know the Father from a very selfish point of view. Isn't that right? You know, I have uh, three children, seven grandchildren now, but I remember when my children were younger that uh, I existed for their sake. <clears throat> it was Daddy do this and Daddy do that. Daddy buy me an ice cream, Daddy push me on the swing, Daddy read me a story, Daddy take me to the zoo, Daddy, you know, and as uh, they got older, the toys got more expensive. Daddy, I'm off to college, I need a Honda. <clears throat> but it was uh, me serving them. You know, what can I do for you now? And uh, thank God that God does condescend to meet our needs. He is a father. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, he does take care of our needs. But... Uh, it says here, I write to you, fathers, because you know him that is from the beginning. Let me just zero in. I've said all of that to get you to this one word, the word beginning. The word beginning. John, more than any other writer, talks about the beginning of things. He begins his gospel in the beginning. It was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He begins his epistle, what was from the beginning, what we've seen and heard. Our hands have handled and so on. Uh, he gave us, of course, the book of Revelation where he talks about Jesus Christ being the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And more than any other writer, he uses this term, the beginning. And uh, the beginning of things gives us a whole new perspective. We will never understand the cross until we understand the beginning of things. The word that I would use for fathers is the word consummation or culmination. In other words, fathers see the big picture. Children have a very myoptic uh, way of looking at things. They, uh, you know, live in the present. Isn't that right? You know, a child, you give him a toy, he's happy. Brother or sister takes it away, they burst into tears. Uh, all they think about is the immediate. They don't think uh, long term. But fathers are always thinking of the big picture, and we need to do the same thing, biblically speaking. And it's only when we begin to see things in the, uh, by sort of uh, uh, not uh, looking through a microscope, but looking through a telescope, so to speak, that we will ever understand the cross. And so what I want to do tonight is take you back to the beginning. How many of you know that we live in the midst, according to the Word of God, of a crooked and perverse generation? In other words, everything that we see now around us is perverted. It is not the way God intended. <clears throat> Thank you. I think there is one up here, but I'll take another one. Oh, this is a better one. All right. I've been getting over a little bit of a... Uh, it's allergy season in America, and I've never been subject to allergies until we moved to Arkansas a couple of years ago. And now I've uh, succumbed for whatever reason, so it's just left me with a little tickle in my throat, so bear with me. Um, but um, 
Like I said, we, we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Everything that we see now is not the way God intended it to be. And until we go back to the beginning, we will never understand what God's intention was. It's uh, rather like um, restoring, uh, say, an old car. Let's say that I'm in the, uh, the business of restoring old cars and I stumble across an old uh, Ford. Let's say going back to the 20s. Somebody here into... Oh, another one. My goodness. <laughs> we'll be able to have a baptismal service here pretty soon. But, uh, all right. Thank you. I appreciate it. I guess if you give a cup of cold water, you get a prophet's reward, even though I'm not a prophet. But uh, anyway, that's the promise. But let's say I stumbled across an old car, uh, and it's a 1920 you know, model A or T, whatever it was. I wasn't around back then. Uh, and that car is reasonably well intact, but uh, somebody's taken the uh, wheels off it. The headlights are missing, and um, the seats have gone. But the engine and the rest of the body is reasonably uh, intact. And I begin to restore that car. <clears throat> In uh, the process of restoring it, I... Um, get the engine running, obviously, get uh, the thing uh, painted. And if I'm going to drive it, obviously, I need wheels. And so I go down to the local uh, Goodyear place, and I get some uh, nice uh, fatso tires, mag wheels, and, uh, you know, I get those fitted on the car. If I'm going to drive it at night because the headlights are missing, I need some headlights. And so, again, I go to the auto place, and I get some little square halogen headlights, modern headlights. Uh, the bumper's gone, and so the fender. And so I need to uh, get an, a bumper now to protect my investment. <clears throat> I go down to the wrecking yard, and I get a great big plastic monstrosity off, you know, some uh, late model car. And now the car is uh, intact. It's got wheels. It's got a headlight. It's got a bumper to protect it, and so on. And then with uh, much uh, joy, I uh, take my car out on its sort of maiden voyage, and as I'm driving down the street... Uh, there's an old man there standing, and he looks at me, and, you know, sort of a strange look on his face, and I think, you know, this man's uh, overcome with nostalgia. And so I slow down, and in fact, back up, and I say, well, what do you think? You know, I noticed that you were looking at me, and much to my chagrin, he says, what is that? And I said, how old are you? He says, well, I'll be 95 years of age next week. I say, well, you mean you don't recognize this as a 1925 Model T? And he shakes his head. He said, son, that's not a 25 T. Uh, first of all, never had headlights like that. It never had a bumper like that. Certainly didn't have those tires you've got on it and so on and so forth. You know, you, you think you've restored it back to its original condition. But uh, originally, that car had little narrow tires and wooden spoke wheels, not alloy wheels that you've got on. It had round headlights. And he begins to point out all the things that are wrong. I'm convinced if the Apostle Paul met the average Christian today, he'd say, you're a what? You know, uh, you're not the sort of Christian I remember, you know. And, uh, and so we need to go back to the beginning to understand what the cross is all about. The cross really is, uh, is God's medicine for man's sickness. Let me say that again. The cross is really God's medicine for man's sickness. How do you know then that that medicine has taken its effect? If I woke up with aches and pains in my body, uh, hacking cough and runny nose and uh, just uh, aches and pains in every joint, and I go to the doctor, we have a number of them here, I guess, and uh, I say, Doc, uh, there's something wrong. He prescribes some medication and says, take this for the next 10 days and you should be fine. At the end of those 10 days, I still have all these same symptoms. I am either going to find another doctor or I'm going to uh, say to him, listen, uh, you did not uh, diagnose my condition properly or this medication is wrong. It may say such and such, but it's not working. Because if that medicine works, it will bring me back to what? My original condition. The aches and pains will go, the runny nose will go, the headaches will go, and all of those things, and I will be back to normal. That is what the cross is to do in our life. It is to bring us back to God's original standard. Remember Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. 
If you think about that, uh, there's, uh, you can look at it uh, in a, just a very shallow sense that uh, uh, Moses lifted up the brazen serpent, Jesus was lifted up on a, on a, on a cross, and uh, that's as far as it goes. But if you delve into it a little bit more, why was the brazen serpent necessary to begin with? Because man sinned. Sinned against God, sinned against the leadership, and so on and so forth. God sent judgment in the form of serpents, so serpents came in. People began to die by the thousands. Moses cried out to God for an answer, and he was told, uh, make a brazen serpent, and whoever looks at that brazen serpent will be restored, basically. I don't know how long the death process was, but uh, let's imagine that you know, a serpent comes in, and all of a sudden a person begins to feel a little woozy and can't stand and lies down, goes into convulsions and has a fever, and three or four hours later passes away. And so uh, here is somebody now, they're complaining, and a serpent comes in the tent, and uh, immediately the symptoms begin, and they cry out, and somebody says, take that person quickly and make them look at that uh, brazen serpent. All of a sudden, the life begins to flow back into them. The convulsions cease, the pain ceases, the headaches cease, and uh, you know, the, the strength comes back into the body. Pretty soon, they're up and standing and robust and ready to go back to to work. In other words, they're restored back to their original condition. That is what the cross is all about. Even as Moses lifted up the serpent, we are to come back to our original condition. Having said that then, let's go back to the book of Genesis. And what we want to do now for a, a little while, <clears throat> I want to uh, talk about the beginning of things. Genesis chapter 2. As you know, the book of Genesis means the book of beginnings. And in Genesis 2, verse 15, we find man in his original condition. There is no sin. Nothing has been distorted. Nothing is perverted. Nothing is twisted. There's no, lo there's no crooked and perverse generation at this particular time. We just have God's uh, creation that was good in his sight. Verse 15 and the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. That is the way God intended man to be. Now you can break that verse down into three areas. First of all, the word submission, then location, and then vocation. First of all, submission. The Lord God took the man. In other words, God as Lord, as Master, had total and complete authority over man. Man was not resistant. There's not heel marks all the way over, you know, the Garden of Eden where God is reluctantly dragging man and saying, I'm bigger than you and stronger, so you've got to do what I want you to do. No, man is co completely compliant and submitted to the will and the purpose of God so that God is able to take him and place him in uh, whatever place he chooses. In this uh, place, of course, uh, in this verse, it is the Garden of Eden. So we have a location. God says, this is the location that I have chosen for you. Not a location that you've chosen, but I've chosen. And then in that location, he reveals his vocation. I've placed you here so that you can serve me. And this is what I want you to do in this particular location. <coughs> now, I'm convinced if we understand the cross correctly, that God will bring us back to that place where at any given time he should be able to reach into your life and not my life without any resistance on our part, where we are totally and completely submitted to his lordship, and he can then take us and place us in whatever geographical location he chooses, whether it's Australia or Africa or India, you know, Asia, wherever it is, and then in that location reveal why he's placed us there. I place you here to serve me. This is my will for your life. This is what I want you to do. Notice God does not give man a personality test and say, well, you know, we'll see how you fare. If you come out with a green thumb, I've got this incredible garden with all this uh, horticulture and plants, and, uh, you know, you'll have a time of your life. On the other hand, if you're a little more artistic, yeah, I've got this villa down near the beach, and, uh, you know, I'll give you a digital camera and some paints, and you can just have a, you know, a great time. No, God says, this is my plan for your life. Man obviously sinned, and... Uh, came short 
of God's uh, glory and God's purpose and so on. But the cross is to bring us back to this particular place. The cross, again, God's medicine for man's sickness. When we are restored, when we are normal in the eyes of God, this is what we should look like here in this particular place. Now, what, what I want to do now, again, for a few minutes is uh, try and get into the mind of God, the understanding of God as to why he created man. So let's uh, look at a few verses in the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 16. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things are being created by him. Let me just pause there for a moment. I trust you don't have a problem with that. The Bible is emphatic that uh, God is right and Darwin is wrong. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And uh, I don't have a problem with the earth being a trillion years of age or more than that because uh, as uh, I think it was Lauren Cunningham said many years ago, God can create a a rock with vintage. In other words, he could create the earth 6,000 years ago with vintage. After all, man had vintage when he was created. He turned water into wine. It had vintage, uh, even though it was just created. So, uh, you know, God is capable of doing anything, isn't he? But the Bible declares that God is the creator. <clears throat> but then uh, Paul sort of fine-tunes it a little bit here. And he says, all things are being created by him and for him. That is important. In other words, when we enter into the mind of God, the understanding of God, we need to understand why God created everything that he created. Everything was created by him and for him, including you. In other words, God did not simply create man in the beginning, give the world a good spin and say, I'll be back in a few thousand years, check up and see how you're doing. No, he created everything for himself, for his pleasure, and so on. In the uh, book of uh, Revelation, Revelation chapter 4, again these are just uh, verses talking about God's purpose. Verse 11, worthy art thou, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou didst create all things. Once again, the declaration that God is the creator of all things. And then it goes on, and because of your will, they existed. And were created. The King James says, and for your pleasure, they were created. <coughs> so God created everything for his pleasure, for his will. And uh, we then exist for the will of God and for the pleasure of God. Hebrews chapter 2. It says, for, verse 10, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things. Suck on a lozenger. May help my voice a little bit here. Let me put that in the order of the other verses. For it was fitting for him, speaking of Christ, through whom are all things, and then for whom are all things. When God created the world, again, it was created for his pleasure and for his purpose. Romans chapter 11. If I said to you Romans 12 and verse 1, how many know that verse without looking at it? A well-known verse, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. How many know the verse prior to that? <clears throat> verse 36. Verse 36 is the foundation of uh, verse 1 of chapter 12. This is possibly the worst chapter division in the Bible. As you know, these, uh, the books of the Bible were not divided into chapters and verses when they were written. Some monk, a monkey, uh, somewhere 
you know, had access and uh, divided them up, and thank God that well, at least we can find our way around a little better that way, but this is uh, not a good chapter division. Verse 36, it says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory. And then it says, Amen. And so whoever was on duty that day dividing the Word of God up obviously thought this is a good place to uh, take a coffee break. And when I come back, I'll start a new chapter. Because there's an Amen there. But it, the Amen is, uh, think about this. Everything is from Him. He is the creator of all things. Everything is through Him. He is the sustainer of all things. In Him we live, we move, we have our very being. All things are held together by the word of His power. So He's not only the creator, but He's the one that's sustaining all things. Not only that, but He is the ultimate consummator. It is from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. Therefore... I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you give back to God your body, which is from Him and through Him and belongs to Him as your reasonable offering of worship. Paul is laying a foundation. If you have that in your understanding, if that is part of your grid, so to speak, that everything is from Him, everything is through Him, everything belongs to Him, the very least you can do once you have that as a revelation, is give back to God that which He created, that which He sustains, and that which ultimately will go to Him. And um, so once again, we are getting into the, trying to get into the mind of God here. We, we need to understand this before we look at the cross. What was God's original intention? What was God's original purpose? And His original purpose was that everything, again, was to uh, find its way back to God as the, uh, the source. That's a good verse, incidentally, if I can digress for a moment, to analyze any sort of current, you know, truth through. Is it from God? Is it through God? And then ultimately, is it to God? <clears throat> you take the whole uh, teaching on sort of seed faith, which is very prominent these days. Um, when I grew up, the only teaching on seed faith was what you sow to the flesh, you'll reap. And, you know, you sort of flesh, you reap from the flesh, you sort of the spirit. Now we've turned it and made it a whole financial thing, and it's become solely financial. But uh, is it from Him? Yes, there's numerous scriptures that God is the one that uh, blesses us and so on. Is it through Him? He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing and material blessing in Christ Jesus. All the promises are yea and amen in Christ. But is it to Him? Most of the time it isn't. In other words, we use it to feather our own nest. You know, if you give to my ministry, then God will give back. And so that sounds like a good investment. All I've got to do is give $10, I get back $100. So it's from him and through him, but it's not to him. <clears throat> my father used to tell the story of the multimillionaire that was going around sort of full gospel circles, giving his testimony. And he said it all began in the Great Depression when he was a little boy. And he had saved up uh, 4 or $5, which in those days was... Uh, considerable amount of money for a child to have, and uh, went to church one night. There was a missionary talking about the tremendous needs of the mission field, all the starving orphans and so on, and uh, asked if people could give. Here he was with uh, four dollars in his pocket, all in quarters, and so he took out a quarter and put it in the offering. The problem is the missionary kept on. He came under conviction and guilt and, you know, felt he was a millionaire and couldn't, you know... Uh, get the thought out of his mind that these children are starving and he's got this money that he planned on buying a bicycle with, I guess. And so he put another 25 cents in the offering. <clears throat> Again, the missionary kept on. And cut a long story short, eventually he gave away all $4. And he said, I want you to know that God honored my giving. He said, today I am worth millions. All I said as a result of as a child, I gave everything to God and now I'm worth millions. Of course, the place erupted. Everybody cheering and clapping and so on, but there was a little old lady who wasn't very impressed. She sat on the front row, and when all the applause died down in a whisper that everybody could hear, she said, I dare you to do it again. <laughs> <clears throat> but you see, it's from him, through him, and to him, I want all things. <laughs> but we've made it into a sort of a, you know, a good investment, haven't we? The Bible says he provides seed for what? The sower. Not so you can store it up, but anyway. 
I digress. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul mentions this uh, verse again. Verse 6. Yet for us, he says, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. One Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. He turns around a little bit, but the same thing. It is from him, it is through him, it is for him. I believe that this particular revelation, if you like, influenced everything that Paul did. In fact, to me, it's Paul's greatest revelation. Everything comes from God. Everything is sustained by God, and ultimately everything will find its consummation or its climax in God himself. And uh, if we have that, again, as a, a foundation in our life, it will change everything that we do and everything that we uh, think about. So we've tried to get into the mind of God there for a little while, that everything was created for God, for his pleasure, for his will, for his purpose, and so on. As you well know, sin came into the world. The enemy comes along, deceives man into thinking that he'd be better off running his own affairs instead of being in submission to the will and the purpose of God. Isaiah summarizes man's condition by uh, saying in Isaiah 53 and verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And uh, so sin came in. As a result of that, of course, the cross was uh, necessary. And so uh, the answer to man's sin lay in an understanding of the cross. And that's what I want to uh, look at now. Why did Jesus Christ die? What was the reason that Jesus Christ died? And I think as you will look at these scriptures with me, you'll see that there is a, a whole side of our uh, uh, Christian faith that we have neglected. And I think there is a reason for that neglect. But uh, we are sinners. The essence of all sin is selfishness. Isn't that right? <clears throat> when Jesus challenged people to follow him, he did not uh, give a list and say, if you're prepared to give up 80% of these things, then you can be my disciple. No, he took the axe and he laid it at the root. If any man come after me, he's got to die to self. And if he dies to self, then he can, and only then, can he become my disciple. And uh, there's not much talk these days about dying to self. Most of our Christian books are about self-improvement. We've allowed psychiatry and psychology to come into the church. And it's now all about, you know, your best day yet or whatever, best life yet. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, all about me and mine. And we have a whole rash of books about improving our self-image. Jesus never came to improve your self-image. He came to do away with it, to annihilate it, to crucify it. We're buried with him, supposed to be and are raised up in newness of life. But um, let's uh, turn then to uh, Romans chapter 14. And we're going to look at a number of scriptures now uh, concerning the cross. Verse 7, For not one of us lives for himself, no one dies for himself, for if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Verse 9, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Now notice the reason he died, verse 9, for to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Savior of the world. No, that he might be the Lord. In other words, he died to reestablish lordship. He is Savior, obviously. He does redeem us and cleanse us from sin. But there is something greater. He wants to establish lordship. And so, once again, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And to this end, Christ died, that he might be Lord of the dead and the living. And then we go to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, it says, Looking for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Let me just pause there for a moment. 
I want you to imagine there is a cross here. And uh, on the left side of the cross is what God has done for man. On the right side of the cross is what Jesus Christ has done for God. We are familiar with this side of the cross. It's this side of the cross that uh, we are forgiven. We are cleansed. We uh, pass from death into life. We're taken out of the kingdom of darkness, brought into the kingdom of God's dear Son. We're reconciled to God. We have the peace of God, peace with God. Uh, we come into a new relationship where we can cry, Daddy, Abba, Father, and so on. That's the side of the cross that we're familiar with. And notice he says here, He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. In other words, cleanse us from every lawless deed thing that we've ever done. The Bible defines sin as a transgression of the law. So we were all lawless. We've all broken the laws of God. And so he came to redeem us or cleanse us from that. <clears throat> But then it says, and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. So he not only cleansed us, but he came to claim us. What the blood cleanses on this side of the cross, the blood lays claim to on this side. You'll notice that it is a people that God wants as his own possession. Let me uh, go back for a moment and give you a, another car illustration. Sorry, ladies, I know that cars don't exactly get you very thrilled and excited, but most guys sort of like cars stories. But um, let's, let's assume that my wife and I have only been married one year. This is purely an illustration. And when we got married, we had a number of debts. And so we've agreed together as a young married couple that we will not uh, be extravagant in uh, buying things. We will do everything within our power to pay off our, our debts. And uh, that is the agreement we've made. Uh, we've now celebrated our first anniversary, and all our debts have been paid. <clears throat> Not only have our debts been paid, but we've accumulated now $1,000. I take my wife out to eat, which is the first time in a year because we've been very frugal about not wasting money. And so we're celebrating our anniversary, and across the table in the restaurant, I say to her, darling, Wouldn't it be great if, I could, uh, if we could have a car? One of the things we've done without for that year is a car because uh, we've been able to get local transport or maybe a carpool or something. And she says, oh, it'd be great if we had a car. I said, you know, I'm tired of, uh, you know, depending on people to take us to church and we've sort of worn out our welcome a little bit anyway. And uh, why don't we buy a car? And she said, uh-uh, listen, you promised we would not go back into debt. I said, uh, but we've got $1,000 in the bank. She laughs and says, you mean you think you can buy a car for $1,000? I say, well, give me a chance. She says, well, if you really think you can, uh, go ahead. But not a penny more. We're not going back into debt. And so I say, well, listen, you pray. This is my department. And... Um, She goes into the closet to pray. In the meantime, I go scouring around all the car yards. And finally, after several hours, I come across an old car, 25 years of age. Seems to be running reasonably well. And it's $990. I buy it. That car is filthy. It's got 25 years of accumulated dirt on it. Let me add to the illustration by saying that my wife and I, during that first year of marriage, have established a reputation in the little community where we live as being Mr. and Mrs. Clean. Everything about our lives is immaculate. Our house, even though we don't have a lot of uh, possessions, everything is immaculate. The windows are always, you know, clean. The lawn's always beautifully manicured and, uh, and so on. And that's the reputation that we have. Everybody knows us in the community as Mr. and Mrs. Clean. I buy this car. When I come into the community, I immediately drive it around the back of the house so nobody can see it, and I begin washing that car. <clears throat> After all, that car is going to be a reflection of the owner of that car, and um, so I start washing that car. I spend hours washing that car. After taking a 
huge bucket of soapy water and washing it. I then take some solvent to remove the grease and grime. I then cut and polish the car. And um, pretty soon the, the luster comes back and the car almost looks like new. I then tackle the inside of the car. I uh, get the vacuum cleaner and uh, thoroughly vacuum it. I take some upholstery cleaner and do all the upholstery. I'm a fanatic, so I steam clean the engine. And uh, by the end of uh, four or five hours of work, there is not a trace of dirt anywhere on that car. It is immaculate. I then go into the house, and I take with me all the dirt that I got from the car. I pile it on the kitchen table. There are filthy rags, there's paper towels, there's dust. I open the vacuum cleaner and shake out all the dust out of the container. And here on the kitchen table now is this mound of filthy rags, dust and dirt and everything else. And I call my wife. And I say, darling, quick, quick, come here. Look, look, look. She comes out of the closet. She said, I've been praying, you know. And I said, well, look what we got for $1,000. I point to all the dirt. <clears throat> she said, what do you mean? I said, well, look, this is what we got for $1,000. Aren't you happy? I don't think so. When she settles down, she's going she's to say to me, I thought you went to buy a car. In one sense, the cleaning of the car was a byproduct. What I was really after was the car. I wasn't going around trying to find the filthiest car I could to show my ability to clean that car. What I wanted was a car because I had need of a car. And so the car had to be cleansed because it is going to be an extension of who I am and therefore reflect my character. In other words, if I drive around in that filthy car, the neighbor's going to say, well, boy, you know, those people had us fooled. Everybody in the community thinks of Mr. and Mrs. Clean. But have you seen that car he's driving? That is the filthiest car I've ever seen. And he seems quite content. He goes around, you know, with his hand out of the window there, just driving around like, you know. And he's had it now for a month. I could understand if he just drove in, I would expect him to clean it, but he seems to just be happy the way it is. You see, your sin means absolutely nothing to God. In fact, the Bible says when he gets a hold of our sin, he buries it in the depths of the sea. <clears throat> Isn't that right? God does not have a sin collection. He removes your sin where? As far as the east is from the west. He is of uh, purer eyes, the Bible says, and to behold iniquity. In other words, God does not want your sin. It's garbage. It's filthy rags. It's buried. It's in the sea of God's forgetfulness. What he does want is what he created. He wants the car back. And we need to get that as a fundamental understanding in the presentation of the Word of God. It's, all, it, it's become all about sin. Thank God He does cleanse us. Thank God for the blood that washes us and so on. But ultimately, it is about getting a people for Himself. Let's read this verse again. <coughs> he gave Himself for us. We're back in Titus that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession. He doesn't want to possess your sin. He wants to possess you. That's why he redeemed you. You see, he wants to bring us back. That's why unless we understand the beginning of things, redemption really doesn't make any sense. Second Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 15. If there is one single verse of Scripture in the Bible concerning what I'm talking about, I think this is the verse. I spent seven years in my early days of ministry with the Youth of the Mission, met Lauren Cunningham while we were working with David Wilkerson in New York, 
YWAM in those days literally existed in Lauren Cunningham's suitcase. I think there were five or six uh, full-time workers when we joined. And um, in fact, we were instrumental, my wife and I, of bringing YWAM down to New Zealand. Then it came over here to Australia and up to New Guinea and so on. And so I've knocked on doors, grass huts all through Fiji and Tonga and you know, up into the Pacific Islands with uh, YWAM. And most people, of course, think they're saved because of uh, John 3.16. Well, I'm a believer, you know, and that's about it. Well, this is a good substitute for John 3.16. Verse 15, he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves. Now, notice the reason he died. He died for everyone. God so loved the world. But he died that they who live... I think that's most of us here. But they who live should no longer live for themselves. You see, prior to the cross, you and I live for ourselves. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We made our own choices. We did what we wanted to do. That's the essence of sin is selfishness. And the cross is to totally and radically change our whole value system. We are no longer living for ourselves, it says, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. See, that's, that's the, the cross. It's to radically, again, change our whole direction. I'm no longer motivated by what's in it for me. I'm now motivated by, as Paul says, pleasing the Father. I have as my ambition, he said, whether at home or abroad, to be pleasing to him. I'm living for Christ. For me to live is what? Christ. To die is gain. Revelation chapter 5. Again, all these verses now dealing with the same thing, redemption basically. If those haven't convinced you, this one will. Revelation 5, we have this great anthem of praise. They see the Lamb standing as if slain in verse 6. Verse 9, they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou, speaking of the Lamb, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain. Here's the cross again. And its purchase for God with your blood, men, from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and thou hast made them, the ones that he has purchased, to be kings and priests. Now notice what he purchased. He didn't purchase sin. <clears throat> he purchased for God with his blood. You see, the cross really is about God. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. God created man for himself, for his pleasure, for his will. And in the eternal counsel of God, the son said, Father, I will go and I will bring back those banished ones. I will redeem them, the prodigals, if you like. I will lay down my life so that you can have your son and your daughter back that you created for your pleasure, you created in your image. And I will redeem them with my blood, but I will buy them for you. God is not thrilled about sin in that sense. Like I said before, God does not have a sin collection. You know, some people collect stamps and other people collect, uh, you know, baseball cards or whatever it is in Australia, but uh, God does not collect sin. You know, it doesn't have these huge leather volumes in the library of heaven that every once in a while he pulls one down and when there's peace on earth, which isn't very often, you know, he gathers a few cherubim and seraphim and maybe a few archangels and said, you know, have I ever showed you my sin collection? You see this here? You know, this is uh, one of the rarest sins in the world, and I have it. And in fact, this one here, there's only two of these in the world, and I've got one of them, you know. And uh, this one here is my pride and joy, because there's only one of these. It was committed back in the 15th century <clears throat> by an old man up in the mountains of Tibet. And I just got it on eBay the other night. You know, no, God, God is not, you know, into collecting sin. He went to redeem for himself a people. And he purchased with his blood men. 
You see, it's the car that God's after, not the dirt on the car. It's the car that God wants. You see, sin cannot testify. Sin cannot prophesy. Sin cannot witness. Sin has absolutely no value to God. You can. Your light can shine before men. You can express the kingdom of God here on earth. You have value. Your sin doesn't. It's you that God went to redeem for himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. While you're turning to this, let me give you a very quick testimony. I was raised in a Christian home. My father was a hellfire preacher. And I grew up knowing where I was going. Where I was going was to hell. I may, as a child, have accepted Christ. I have no clear recollection of my younger years for whatever reason. But uh, I'm now in my teens as I tell this story. And I knew that I was not right with God. And my father had made hell very real. And um, I had no question about the fact that if I died as a teenager, I would have gone straight to hell. Now, did I want to be saved? I longed to be saved. I longed to have peace with God. I longed to have uh, the, the joy of uh, uh, fellowship with God. I knew all about that. But uh, the problem was, I had, <clears throat> I had goals. I had dreams. I'm the middle child. I had an older brother, a younger brother. The younger brother passed away a number of years ago, but um, both of my brothers were straight-A students. They were top of the class, brilliant and I was the one that brought home F's on my report card on a regular basis, you know, for jobs worth doing. <clears throat> but um, my, my take on it is that God put me in the family to bring humility to the Ravenhill household. But uh, I'm not sure whether that's going to stand in eternity, but uh, that's my take. But I dreaded school. I hated school. But the one thing I enjoyed was art. And I used to draw. And my goal was to have... Uh, my own business, go into the field of graphics. <clears throat> that was where my passion was. That was the thing that excited me. I loved to do oil painting and uh, creative uh, stuff. And I couldn't wait to get out of school and go into this particular career. <clears throat> and somehow I knew that God was after me, and uh, it may mean that I'd have to give up my career. And so the battle started about in the age of 13 when I had a full grasp of what was going on. And um, it lasted until the age of 18. Now, I was never a problem. You know, I tell people that I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I've never been drunk in my life. If that matter, I had alcohol in my life. Never been to a dance in my life and so on. I should be in Guinness Book of Records. I just haven't applied yet. <clears throat> I was a good preacher's kid, not that every preacher's kid is good, but, uh, you know, I was, uh, at least I was. But I also was uh, the worst type of sinner, a religious sinner, you know, self-righteous, you know, I thank God that I'm not like this man type thing. But I also knew that, uh, like I said, I was going to help. I wanted to be saved. I wanted to have peace with God. I would go to sleep at night thinking, you know, if I don't wake up, I know where I'll end up. But I also had this overwhelming desire because it was my identity. I didn't have the ability to function apart from my art. And so that's what I wanted to do. And the battle went on year after year. I would literally shake under conviction of sin. I mean, Hundreds of times when an altar call was given, I knew that I should be going down to that altar. But I knew that God was after me and not my sin. I was happy to give him my sin. That was no problem. I just didn't want to give him what he really wanted. And finally, long story short, at the age of 18, I'd made my way in meeting like this to the altar before anybody came to counsel me, pray with me. I was already talking to the Lord. I said, Lord, you know I'm a sinner. I've done every conceivable sin, at least in my mind, if I haven't done it uh, physically. And I need your forgiveness. I need your cleansing. But Lord, I'm not here tonight just to give you my sin. I'm here to give you my life. And I said, Lord, I surrender everything. All of my dreams, all of my goals, all of my ambitions. I put everything on the altar. 
and I present my body, a living sacrifice, to you. <clears throat> I was uh, terrified that God would call me into some sort of public ministry. I was shy. I would never do anything publicly in school that uh, would draw attention to myself. I would sit at the back of the class and be as quiet as a mouse so I didn't uh, get you know, called to do something. And uh, that which I feared came upon me. Hmm. God called me into the ministry. But that's my testimony in essence. And it was over this issue of lordship. You see, we all need Jesus Christ as our Savior. But we don't really want Him as our Lord, do we? I'm sure all of you have seen the passion, Mel Gibson's portrayal of the death of Christ. But why was Jesus Christ crucified to begin with? <clears throat> we know from, man, uh, from God's point of view, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But why did man put him on the cross? Well, Jesus told us why. He said there was a certain man referring to himself who went to establish a kingdom. And after putting things in motion, he left. And the inhabitants of that would-be kingdom got together. And they said what? We will not have this man reign over us. So let's get rid of it. In essence, that's why Jesus Christ was on the cross. He came unto his own. His own received him not. It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, you know, we look at the cross and we come along, we're a sinner, and we see what Jesus Christ has done, and we say, Lord, I need your forgiveness, I need your cleansing, only your blood can uh, free me from sin. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for taking away my sin. And then we come to this side of the cross and say, let's get one thing straight. I will not have you reign over me. Now, we don't say it in so many words, we just don't preach it anymore. In other words, the, the gospel has morphed. We've, uh, we've packaged it so it's presentable to man. After all, I want to get through the pearly gates. I can only get through the pearly gates if I'm clean. And so I need you as Savior. But I will not have you rule over me. I don't want you telling me what to do. I don't want to come under your lordship, under your control. You know, your kingdom come out there, but not here. Now again, we don't say it in so many words, but that's really the message of the gospel. Some of the world's greatest evangelists will never mention the side of the cross. And so it says here, if I can go back to 1 Corinthians 6, <clears throat> it was just a couple of days after I was saved, at the age of 18, that I opened my Bible to these verses. They become my life verse. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Now you'll notice how much the body is mentioned. Verse 19, do you not know that your body, to use the car illustration, do you not know that your car is now mine? Glorify God with your car. You see, it's not about sin. You are not your own. That's the cross. You were bought with a price. Yes, your sin was dealt with. Yes, your sin was forgiven. But it's you that God ultimately is after. He needs a body, a body thou hast prepared for me. He can't function, the, a head can't function without a body. The church which is what? His body. He needs a body. Otherwise the, the head, no matter how good the head is, it's powerless without a body. And so you're not your own. You're bought with a price. You see, when Paul wrote this, you could go into any marketplace, <clears throat> and after buying your groceries and supplies, you could go to the slave market, which was also part of the marketplace, and you could buy yourself a slave. If you were the highest bidder and you paid the highest price, then you took that slave home. You could beat that slave to death. You could starve him to death, work him to death, love him to death, do whatever you wanted. He was yours. He had no rights. He was now under new ownership. We have been redeemed. We are now under the ownership, mastery of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
In fact, when the Apostle Paul got saved on that Damascus road, had that encounter again, met the Shekinah glory of God, what was the first thing he said? Lord, what will you have me to do? Not Savior, thank you for taking away my sin. Now, obviously, that was part of it. Writing to Timothy later, he says, you know, I was <clears throat> formerly a blasphemer and a violent aggressor and all of those things. But on that particular moment, he bows to the Lordship of God. Lord, and you can't say Lord without, you know, what are your plans? Lord, what will you have me to do? God says, go into town and I'll tell you. I've appeared unto you for this reason. I've got a call on your life. You're going to suffer and so on and so forth. These days we'd have it, you know, I've got a Cadillac waiting for you in town and a million dollars in the bank. But uh, anyway, that's another gospel. <clears throat> Turn with me now to Second Peter. We're drawing to an end here. I want you to see how far now we have drifted from the true gospel. Hebrews warns us about drifting. Beware lest you drift. Drifting is a slow but steady process. You know, you go out fishing, the fish are biting or whatever. You're, you know, sitting in your boat and all of a sudden you look around and you realize that you've drifted. The wharf that you were, you know, started off at is way over there and, you know, and you're not even aware of the fact that you've drifted. Let me show you how far we have drifted now in the presentation of the gospel. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets arose among the people, just as there also will be false teachers among you. Now, I was never very good at English grammar, even though I've uh, got five books and another one on the way. Actually, uh, just written a book on this whole theme that I'm talking to you on tonight uh, called Blood Board. But it says, false prophets arose. That's past tense. In other words, there's been a, pro a problem in the past with false prophets. They've already arisen, just as there will be. In other words, Peter is making a prophetic statement now. He is warning the church. Listen, we've had a problem in the past with false prophets, but I'm warning you that there is coming another problem, and it's going to be in the form of false teaching. And the false teaching will come in secretly. Now, when something is done in secret, nobody is aware of it. <clears throat> My wife and I were missionaries in Port Moresby, New Guinea, from 71 to 73. And uh, one night I went to bed as normal, made sure the doors were locked. I got up in the morning, came out of our bedroom, went down the hallway into the living room, and I noticed the front door was wide open. <clears throat> I uh, couldn't believe that the door was open. I was convinced that I'd locked it as I normally did, and thought, well, maybe I just didn't, you know, the catch didn't catch properly, and the wind blew it open or whatever, so I closed the door, went into the kitchen, and as soon as I came into the kitchen, I noticed the kitchen door was open. And I knew immediately at that stage that we'd had some intruders. They'd uh, taken the mosquito netting off. They'd removed the louvered windows. They'd come in through the windows, left the two doors open. <clears throat> My first concern was our two, we had uh, two daughters at that time. They were asleep in bed, thank God. Began to go through the house, uh, trying to figure out, you know, what they'd taken. Went back into our bedroom and discovered that they'd removed a tape recorder from my wife's side of the bed literally reached almost under her pillow and unplugged it, gone to my side of the bed and taken my uh, wallet, a billfold out of uh, the, the little uh, dresser. A number of other things were taken, but it was all done secretly. I wasn't aware of it. It happened when uh, I was oblivious to what was going on. And this is what um, Peter is talking about. This teaching will come in, and it will be so subtle, it will be done secretly, but the end result, he says, will be destructive. Notice that they will introduce destructive heresies. King James says, damnable doctrines. And then notice, even. 
even means to this extreme, even denying the master who bought them. Even denying the master. Notice it is capitalized, referring to Christ, who bought them. Welcome to the fulfillment of prophecy. We now have a gospel that successfully denies the master who bought you. Man now can be saved and still do his own thing. He just has a cleaned up version, but nevertheless, he's still living for himself, doing his own thing, spending his money the way he wants, his time, everything else. And he said no to the master. That word in the Greek means a despot. It is the strongest use of the word master that we have in the Greek language. You'll notice again the word bought. You are not your own, you were bought. He went and he purchased for God with his blood. This word purchase, this is the word redemption that we're talking about. It wasn't redemption to set us free, although he sets us free from sin. It was a redemption that also claimed us. Then let's go to the book of James before we close. <clears throat> James chapter 4. Verse 13 to 17. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we shall go into such and such a city, spend a year there, engage in business and make a profit. Now, here is somebody, let's, uh, without distorting this word, let's sort of embellish it a little bit by saying, here is a young couple. They met in the youth department at school, uh, the, the church, fell in love, and they got married. They were initially attracted to each other physically. Once they got to know each other, they realized that they both had uh, the same liking. They uh, loved animals. And they both felt they had a call to be uh, veterinary doctors. And uh, so they live in a little town where there's no college. And they apply to a prestigious veterinary school. And they get accepted. And so they have plans to go into the veterinary business. Now notice, every one of us has done what it says there in verse 13. We've been prepared to move in order to engage in some sort of business, and hopefully you go into business and make a profit rather than chapter 11 or declare bankruptcy. <clears throat> if all goes well, you know, your business is to make a profit. Now, there's nothing sinful so far. This uh, young couple is not talking about opening up a house of prostitution. They're not uh, smuggling drugs into the country. They're not going into a counterfeit business. They just uh, got plans to live a normal life, and that life means if I'm going to get ahead, I'm going to have to get a degree, so it means I'm going to have to leave the little town here, go to college, get my degree, and then uh, if I get a degree, I'll get a better job. If I get a better job, I'll have more money. If I get more money, then I'll be able to do all the things I've always wanted to do, and we all fit into that category in some way or other. My idea was, you know, to go into college, get a degree in art, and, and so on. The mistake that this couple makes is in verse 14. They go to Pastor James. The conversation goes like this. Uh, Pastor, could we see you sometime this week? We've got some exciting news to tell you. Pastor James says, sure, drop in any time. Well, what's a good time? Well, how about tomorrow morning? You free? Yeah, okay. How about 10 o'clock? <clears throat> so they come to Pastor James's office, and Pastor James says, well, how can I help you? Well, oh, Pastor, we're so excited, you know, we, and they've got a letter, and, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but, uh, you know, Mary and I met when we were in uh, high school and in the church here, and uh, you were the one, of course, that married us, you remember that, and, but uh, maybe what you didn't know is we, we've had this longing to go into the veterinary business, and, uh, you know, when I met Tom, or Tom says, when I met Mary, I didn't realize she had the same liking, and I got it, and so on, and we've just applied to this uh, prestigious school, and guess what, we've been accepted. And Pastor James, I'm, you know, I hate to say this, but we're going to have to leave town. We're going to be going to Sydney, and you, know, you may not see us for a number of years, and we'd love it if you would pray for us next Sunday as we go. And uh, 
you know, fare well us, and every pastor, you know, does that on a regular basis. <coughs> so, you know, that's the scenario. And uh, they go on about the, all the excitement and how, you know, this is so amazing. And then pastor says, uh, hold on a minute. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And so James says, uh, hold on, kids. Let me tell you something about life. I assume James now has got white hair and a beard. And he says, uh, let me tell you about life. <clears throat> Before you know it, it's gone. It's just a vapor. And he talks about the brevity of life. The Bible talks a lot about the brevity of life, doesn't it? You know, why life is like a weaver's shuttle, one place says. You know, it's, uh, it's just over and gone in a moment. You know, you get married and the next moment you've got grandkids. You think, wow, you know, how did that happen? You know, I mean, it's just... Instead, verse 15, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this or that. In other words, James says, uh, I haven't heard anything about the will of God in this. Is this God's direction or something you've always wanted to do? If the Lord wills, do it. If not, you're wasting a life. When I was a kid in England, we used to have a little song, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how glad I will be that the light of my lamp, uh, that the lamp of my life was burned out for thee. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And James says, instead, you ought to be saying, if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. But as it is, he says, you boast in your arrogance, and that sort of boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one that knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it's sin. Sin is reverting back to a life of selfishness. Sin is reverting back to doing things for your pleasure instead of the pleasure of God. At the end of Isaiah 53, it says there that he may... Let me give you the exact verse... Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. <clears throat> or he will see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Imagine if I have a need to paint my house. And I get a quote on uh, getting my house painted, and it's, uh, let's say, $15,000. I don't have $15,000, and yet the house is uh, deteriorating if I don't paint it. And uh, my friend happens to be there when I get the quote, and I say to him, boy, never thought it would cost that much. <clears throat> and after the gentleman goes, it gives me the quote. He says, listen, I'll tell you what. I've got a couple of weeks coming where I don't have to work, I'll be on vacation, and I'm prepared to give you those two weeks and help you paint the house. We can get it done, the two of us. And I, I can't believe that he'd do that, but sure enough, he shows up every single morning promptly at, uh, let's say, 8 o'clock, works all day till 5 o'clock, and uh, at the end of two weeks, we're just about ready to have uh, concluded the job. We've got just a few hours left the next day. And I say to my wife as uh, my friend leaves, I said, darling, you know, Tom has been amazing. She said, I agree. She said, you have a real trophy there, a real friend. I don't know of too many people that would give up their vacation to work the way he has. And he said, I don't want any pay whatsoever. And I say, well, I say to my wife, you know, we've got to give him some sort of token of appreciation. <clears throat> she said, I can't agree more. 
So what are we going to give him? We've got to show him some sort of token of appreciation. She said, well, let me call his wife, and I'll find out what he hates. She comes back a few minutes later. She says, I found out that uh, the thing he hates the most, you know, I'm making this up as I go along. So let's say oysters. <laughs> Possibly not a good choice for something you would. And so I go out and I buy him, you know, a huge bag of oysters. And uh, the next day when we complete the job, I say to Tom, I said, Tom, listen, I bought you something just to show you how much I appreciate all you've done. And I hand him a bag of oysters that I know he hates. Now, obviously, that's a crazy illustration. That to show somebody your appreciation by giving him what he hates the most. The Bible says here that Jesus Christ will see of the travail of his soul. It's talking about his death. And be satisfied. And yet the only thing we give him is the thing that he hates. Our sin. Again, he is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. He can't look at sin. You see, I dare say, and I've said it many times, most Christians have given God their sin... Very few have given him their life. We give God the garbage. Take, you know, all this sin, all this foul language, whatever it is, all these things that I've done. Lord, I, I want to be washed. I want to be clean. And then we walk out and we just say, thank you, Lord. I tell people at the age of 18, I not only gave God my sin, I gave him my life. He saw the travel, travel of his soul, and he was satisfied for the joy set before him. What was that joy? That he might see again all the prodigals brought back. That he might redeem for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. That's what he's after. And somehow we need to get back again to... A correct understanding of the cross. It is God's medicine for man's sickness, but that medicine, if it really has its full impact, is to bring us back to God's original intention, God's original purpose before there was sin. That we might be a people that He takes pleasure in. For His will, we live. In Him we live, we move, we have our very being. There's a cost involved, isn't there? And yet we've taken that cost out of our presentation of the gospel now. We've made it almost irresistible. We've repackaged it in such a way. But once you put the cross back in there, it becomes the true gospel. We are fighting now in, uh, around the world this terrorist, these terrorist attacks. The Islamic faith, as you know, is becoming more and more militant. And one of the reasons that no government in the world can do anything about it is they're willing to give up their life. And there is no answer for that. Because they're willing to blow themselves up and uh, they totally disregard their lives for the greater cause, if you like. And yet that's what this book is supposed to be about. Not that we go around blowing up places, but we have no regard. They love not their lives. Unto death, the Bible says. <coughs> and yet today, the gospel is all about self. Self-improvement instead of a true death to self. Lord, what will you have me to do? And God is looking for a people, again, that have prepared to give themselves unreservedly to God himself. And say, Lord, take me and use me. I'll go where you want me to go. Like Ruth, whether thou goest, I'll go. Your people be my people. Your God, my God. Will you die? I'll die. The cross. Let's just close in prayer. Our time is just about gone. We're a few minutes early. But Father, we thank you again for your word tonight. Lord, we think of the potential in this room to change the world. You did it with 12 men. 
that gave themselves totally to the kingdom. Father, we pray that, Lord, out of this group tonight, Lord, there would be men and women that would give back to you their life, surrender every plan, every goal, every ambition to the will and to the purpose of God. Father, they, they might be able to say, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm going to glorify God with my body. Let's take a moment. I don't want to just rush this. You can build an altar right where you are. Say, Lord, here is my life. I gave you my sin five years ago, ten years ago, maybe thirty years ago. But Lord, I have never consciously given you my life. And tonight, Lord, I give you my life. Over the course of the next number of weeks and months, begin to show me your plan and your purpose. Lord, from this moment on, I want to live for you. You died to establish your lordship. I take you as my Lord and Master. My time, my money, my life belongs to you. Reveal to me your plan. Reveal again your purpose.